All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Physical Media Past, Present, and Future. Uh, I called it this because I could not call it um, streaming, <laughs> streaming stinks, physical media rules. I'm not <laughs> allowed to do that. There we go. But a lot of this is, you know, this is a bit of a passion project for me, although all of these programs sort of are. But the idea in the past two years, the ownership and the ability to own physical media has become something I'm really passionate about. I've always been a bit of a movie hoarder. Um, if you were to go to Todd and I's house, uh, when we had to pack up all of our discs in order to, you know, we had our floors done, we had to pack up all of our discs and keep them downstairs. I think we had a total of 10 boxes. Um, I'm ter I'm terrified what's going to happen if we ever move. Between that and our books, we're going to need like a U-Haul for those things alone. But with streaming and with digital ownership of movies, we're starting to see some of the benefits of physical media. But we will get to that um, towards the end of the program. So just a quick primer. When I'm talking about physical media today, I mean, physical media encompasses a lot of things. Technically, a film strip is a physical media, but we don't really own film strips of movies unless you're a collector. And then, of course, there's stuff like CDs and records as they relate to music. But today, we are just going to be talking about film and TV and, you know, something that allows you to own your own copy or at least view your own copy physically, be it a disc or a tape. Or uh, if we really want to get cheeky, um, an external hard drive with a lot of uh, movie copies that, uh, let's just say, fell off the back of the truck or um, fell off the back of the Academy screeners. Because let me tell you, when I used to download movies to watch in Pirate, so many of them had a, for Academy consideration, do not distribute on yeah. that. Someone clearly distributed them. I think they know what happens at this point. They just don't care. <laughs> I mean, in their defense, now they're getting to the point where there's been award winners that never see a physical release. We'll get there. I, I will air my grievance on that one. But we're going to talk a little bit about before physical media. So when I talked about how a film strip is technically physical media, that is true. That is film in a physical form. But you really couldn't own film stock. And unless you had a projector, you couldn't play it at home. And a lot of normal everyday people did not have that. Not to mention that older film stock had to be stored. Um, and in some cases stored in climate controlled areas because the old stuff was uh, made of, what was it, Todd, nitrate? Or I believe nitrate? that was it, yeah. Nit and they were extremely flammable. If you've seen the Quentin Tarantino film Inglorious Bastards, where that is a, um, let's just say a plot point for the end. That's not a joke when they're saying they were considered so hazardous they couldn't be taken on public transportation. There were some places where they're like, we do not want to deal with that on hot days. So um, physical media technically did exist, but not for home ownership. So how did people see films? Well, obviously going to the theater, going to a movie helped. And in many cases, films would come back to theaters and get screened again and again. And even with the advent of television, that's how films would find new audiences. It would be with, um, you know, technically like screenings, premieres, and reruns. I am still old enough to remember when the network television premiere of a film was a big deal. Um, I remember, was it, I believe it was 1996 or 1997, Schindler's List being shown on network television, especially without any edits or censorship, was a big deal. Now, a film getting a network television premiere is not a big deal at all. It's more we're wondering, hey, when is this going to hit HBO? And that's if you don't have streaming. Because now people just go, when is this going to hit whatever streaming service it will hit? But there were, you know, films could still, as we'll talk about later on streaming, films could get lost. There were some films that never really were popular enough to go back to theaters or were too controversial to go back to theaters um 
or sometimes the film strips were just lost. There are some films that are lost to time, especially a lot of older movies, or you couldn't buy the rights to them or, you know, the network didn't want to buy the rights to them. So they just weren't shown. So there were, even back then, times where just films fell through the, the cracks of the collective culture. But still, people were allowed to rediscover films with, you know, rescreening and re-releases in theaters. And that was something that was done up until th- the 1980s. Disney, uh, Disney was having a really hard time with their new content in the 1980s. So what they would do was re-release all of their beloved old Walt Disney content for another run into the theaters to make more money. Um, you know, Todd, weren't they just doing that now with some of their films? In particular, some of the ones that they initially had dropped straight onto Disney Plus, they were kind of like, yeah, okay, during COVID. our bad. Yeah, during COVID, but uh, other people have said, oh, is this just a way for them to make money because a lot of their recent movies haven't done that well? Yeah. So, yeah, still can be done. And we are seeing kind of the resurgence of anniversary screenings come up, but they're, they're more for one or two, you know, they're, they're either for a week or maybe they're one or two nights, like a fathom event. They're not a full run in the theater. And also keep in mind back in the day, a run in the theater was a year long run, sometimes more. It wasn't a month to two months before it hits disc. And I did want to give a shout out to Super 8 Films because that was a way for you to own your own film, but it was your own film. These are ways for people to make their own movies, sometimes home videos, sometimes they had, they're like, we're going to make our own little movie, but it wasn't the same as owning a film that already existed. And hey, there were a lot of filmmakers that got their start making Super 8 Films. So... What is the best precursor to physical media? Um, I mean, it'd be too easy to say, well, film strips, obviously, but film strip was a copy of a movie it, versus this, the quadruplex. And if you look at one of the images, that is how a quadruplex was played. I mean, man, we think VCRs look bulky or those old CRTVs look bulky. Look at that for comparison. But the quadruplex was the first time something could be recorded. And that is why it seemed like a lot of people consider to be the best thing to consider the precursor. So this came around in 1956. So it is technically a commercial tape format. And it was mainly there to professionally record a television program. So that was a way, like, if you were a TV station, you wanted to have something recorded for future use or just for archival purposes, this is what you had. But it allowed for stuff to be recorded in different time zones. It could be resold. So what does this sound like? Sounds a little bit like VHS and Betamax. Um, but again, look at how you played that. You couldn't have that in a home setting unless you had a whole lot of money. So this was mainly used by, again, television studios, um, and other filmmakers as a way to like, you know, to record things, but it gave us, it basically gave people who were looking to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? looking to see where can we go forward with the distribution of home media, it gave them the idea. This was the building block that gave us VHS and Betamax. And I also wanted to say there is a great website if you want to take a look at it. It's called the Museum of Obsolete Media. They have this. They have a lot of really cool and nifty um, physical media of yesteryear, including some stuff that only existed for a year or two. Um, But it's a really fun website if you're ever interested in kind of just charting where the stuff came. So I said this was kind of the precursor to tape, but um, we're going into tape mania. Now, say in the chat, how many of you, um, how many people here used VHS versus how many used Betamax? I'd be interested because I was born, I'm just going to say I was born in the 1980s. Um, I'm, I'm old, Again, as I said, I'm old enough to remember X, Y, and Z. I'm old enough to have seen Jurassic Park in theaters. I'm old enough to remember the Disney Renaissance when it first happened. Um, so, But I grew up with VHS only. But for uh, the, something that predated me, there was the VHS and Betamax battle. So 
Betamax predates VHS by a year, made by Sony. Um, but if you're an American, Betamax wasn't really something that you were you had unless you were an aficionado of beta uh, of this format. It kind of was what vinyl was for a little while, where it still existed, but it was something that was very curated, uh, very curated, and it was a very small amount of people. Uh, the reason VHS, which you know made its debut one year later, really won, was because they um you could record longer um and put more like you could put more movie on a VHS tape than you could a Betamax so that really was the um probably the thing that really swung it there was also just the idea that more people liked the like you know VCR just appealed to more people there was something about it where people were like oh well we'll use this but a lot of it had to do with the fact that you could have a longer recording time for VHS, meaning let's say you had a longer movie. You could only like anyone remember the Titanic box set two uh, two tapes with Betamax, potentially you might have needed a third. So if you're a film company and you're thinking about distributing home media, what would you rather have a set with two tapes or one tape or a set with two tapes or three tapes? So that was a big thing. Also, there were blank VHS tapes, which was what people used to record stuff off the television or make copies of other movies. And we'll get to why that's important as well. And VHS had its real heyday was in, I'd say, the 80s. There's a whole nostalgia around VHS covers, especially VHS covers designed in the 1980s. There are a number of great coffee table books about that. Um... I'll get to this a little later, but there were a lot of stores where, you know, they would decide what to buy based off of covers. So let's say the covers could be a little misleading. And, um, but even VHS eventually could not compete with discs. Um, and there were a lot of pluses to discs that VHS did not have. You know, DVDs, you didn't have to rewind them. DVDs, you could skip to a scene. DVDs, uh, your mom couldn't tell if you kept watching that one part in Fast Times at Ridgemont High over <laughs> and over again. And you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Versus if you had VHS, it's like, huh, this tape's really worn at this one moment. Wait a minute. Um, and it kind of died a slow death in the early aughts. It finally died in the late um aughts i think the final ma the final major film recorded released on vhs was a history of violence but vhs has not died we will uh get to that but it has become a collector's market like vinyl it's kind of having its own little resurgence and i kind of went off a little bit on why vhs won over betamax but betamax not vhs was the basis for one of the most important uh, court cases that involves physical media and your right to record. And that is the Sony Corp of America versus Universal City Studios. Um, this was a court case that actually started back in 1975, and it was decided nine years later by the Supreme Court of the United States. So what happened was when Sony introduced Betamax, one of the marketing was build your own library. Now, this was back in 1975. This was when home ownership of media was not really mainstream, meaning a lot of studios made a lot of money showing their films on television and re-releasing them into theaters. So Disney and Universal looked at this device and looked at this marketing and said, oh no, this is going to cost us money. This is going to affect our plans to re-release films. Uh, we're going to lose money because instead of constantly watching them on TV, they'll just record it. So they filed a lawsuit in 76 and in initially California court ruled in favor of Sony. Um, obviously Disney and Universal, Universal was the one who really kept going with this, um, appealed it. And then the appeals court reversed that decision, but it still went to the Supreme Court of the United States. And in 1984, Supreme Court ruled that recording a program for quote unquote time shifting, this is some antiquated language, which is just taping for future viewing does not constitute copyright infringement. This is fair use because as um, a lot of the lawyers argued, they said 
they're they're only likely going to use it for their own home viewing. They are not going to show their we have no way of proving if someone who records a movie off of television is going to show it publicly. We have no way of proving they can make money off of it. And also by the 1980s, the evidence has shown most people just wanted to tape it so they had a copy themselves versus um showing it to other people. So that really kind of swung it in favor of Sony. So the the fact that you can tape stuff off TV, the fact that you can even copy movies, it is this court case. And it's one that's really unknown unless you're really into physical media like I am. Um, a podcast I, I mention a lot, 80s all over, you know, RIP, too good for the sinful earth. They talked about this in um for one of their episodes because they said this is such a this is a groundbreaking case that nobody knows about, but it really changed the direction of where physical media can and did go. So we're going on to the media that a lot of people probably recognize right now is disc media. And when we think of disc media, we think of DVDs, we think of Blu-ray, we think of 4K, we think of um that weird little offshoot um HD DVD. I guess that's kind of like a Australopithecus afarensis version of disc media where it branched off and then it just went, just died off. <laughs> like a less lucky that. Betamax. <laughs> that too. Less lucky Betamax is a better way of putting it. Because at least Betamax, Betamax was still being produced into the early aughts. Like Betamax had like, same with this, Betamax had popularity in Japan and other parts of Asia. It Like VHS ruling, ruling the market was not a worldwide thing uh, but laserdisc came out in this set it set the stage for disc media but disc media wouldn't really become a thing until almost 30 years later so the original demonstration was in 1972 and it hit the market in 1978 but now when we look at the specifics, we can see why laser di we can see why discs didn't catch on right away. So it's a foot long as opposed to a, D a DVD disc, which is a lot smaller. And it could play 60 minutes on each side. So multiple discs for films. Imagine if you had a movie like Killers of the Flower Moon. That's three and a half hours. You're going to need multiple discs for that. Um, so yeah, that again, going back to time and going back to storage, that was a big reason why it didn't catch on the way VHS did in the United States. But again, has a following in places like Japan. There are still people that collect, um, that collect laser discs and, uh, Criterion, the Criterion collection, that imprint was one of the first, um, imprints to utilize Laserdisc. And there were a lot of films that were released on Laserdisc that never actually made the jump to DVD and Blu-ray, mainly for rights reasons, but, um, just a cool little piece of trivia. Um, Todd, did, did Criterion use VHS at all, or did they mainly just stick to discs? So there's been some back and forth about this. For the sounds of it, it seems like they very briefly dabbled in VHS, and even then it was more like those are more for the rental market than for, like, private home ownership. Yeah. And it was it looks like it was predominantly stuff like Orson Welles and Hitchcock, so this was... Yeah. They were really testing small oh, markets. Testing to see what it was, because for a while, even something like a VCR was, like, you, you know, a little hard to afford for a family, or they're like, well, it's cheaper to rent a movie than buy a movie. We don't know if we'll really like it. So... In some ways, the rental market was a safer way to go rather than um, immediately putting something out for home ownership. But disc media evolved, even though there was kind of a bump in the road. It's interesting to look at tape versus VHS because tape, film strip and tape just dominated for so long and then eventually just went almost completely obsolete versus disc media has continued and um to really chug along i know that a lot of people have said with streaming this might be the death knell for discs as well but um we're not seeing that i mean people thought that when blu-ray came out dvds would go away completely dvds are still being produced uh people thought that 4k would get rid of blu-ray blu-rays are still being produced um probably because 
and this is just me speculating, I think it is because for a lot of more lay people, the format is all the same. It's just a disc versus when v when DVD came along to replace VHS, it was a, oh, this is a whole new format and this is a lot more convenient than VHS versus there are some people who do not care about picture, who don't really pay attention to picture quality or they're, um, they're like me, who's a little like, I'm going to wait out a little bit and see if this new format really sticks. Um, although I I pretty much don't do DVDs anymore unless there's no other option. But there have been some where I'm like, I'm going to keep this Blu-ray for a while and see if 4K is the way it's going. Or, I mean, I know I waited a bit on 4K because I'm like, I don't know, we've had other stuff introduced and it just fizzles out. But 1978, Laserdisc goes public for ownership. And then again like 20 years later almost 30 if we're counting the original um like origin of uh laserdisc dvds come to play and then in 2002 dvd surpasses vhs i don't remember dvds personally being that big of a thing until 1999 todd what about you just about yeah like i don't really yeah. remember prior to that really it was kind of seen as more like a novel and like a novelty more like more of a specialty thing before then yeah uh, well again i think for a lot of people especially like everyday consumers there was an idea of well let's see if this thing actually becomes the new format to buy versus i'm going to get rid of all my tapes right away and then it turns out dvd fizzles out so 2002 dvd surpasses vhs um, and then around like 97, 98, VHS really just, you know, croaks. 2006, we have HD, DVD, and Blu-ray discs come on the scene. And then two years later in 2008, HD, DVD loses that battle. And then eight years later, we have 4K discs, which are becoming, um, 4K HD is kind of becoming the new format. A lot of stuff is getting re-released on there. Um, but from what I'm seeing right now, not every movie that gets released, even a recent movie, is automatically getting a 4K release. Sometimes it just gets Blu-ray. So little aside on the DVD, uh, the Blu-ray versus HD DVD. So a lot of people kind of saw this as, oh, it's the VHS versus Betamax thing again. And I guess you could say, yes, kind of. There's some differences here. So once again, there, Sony's in the picture. Sony develops Blu-ray this time. And hey, look, this time Sony developed the winning format. Toshiba developed HD DVD. And while HD DVD Blu-ray players were cheaper, um, the Blu-rays had more storage capacity. Once again, storage capacity becomes a thing. The other big factor was even while studios were taking sides um sony owned playstation which is a video game console and when the P playstation 3 came out they decided oh we're putting a blu-ray player on here and while the playstation 3 wasn't as big of a seller as playstation 2 a lot of people in the industry saw this as okay the precedent has been set blu-ray looks like it's the way to go and the also you know sony also had the advantage of kind of looping a lot of other companies in to form a blu-ray disc association here um so it really even with some studios siding with certain formats eventually enough chips came in onto the side of blu-ray um and again a lot of people look looking back they're like it's the playstation 3 decision that really made it because a lot of people looked at it as like oh okay, I guess that's what we're doing now because a lot of people play video games. A lot of people wanted to own a PlayStation 3. And all of a sudden, a lot of studios looked and they said, well, we want our stuff purchased by the people who are buying a PlayStation 3. We better put this out on Blu-ray. And the players and HD DVDs ceased production after only two years of its introduction. It's definitely a much quicker death than the VHS and Betamax um, thing because you don't hear people having nostalgia for HD DVDs at all. And personally, as someone who has seen both Blu-ray and HD DVD, I thought HD DVD, the format in the picture looked ugly. It looked like I was watching a soap opera. I was personally not a huge fan of it. I think Blu-ray is was and is definitely the better way to have that picture quality. So 
I am going to give an ode to one of my favorite things ever, the video rental store. I mean, this was one of the ways I got into movies. Um, there was the uh, little tiny rental store in Camp Lejeune. There was that uh, I noticed a lot of stuff I probably shouldn't be watching. And, you know, good call for my parents at the time. They were renting those movies for me. And, you know, I also lived, like, there was a time where you didn't even need to go to a video rental store proper. You could go to a grocery store and there was a video rental shelf. And I remember asking my mom, mom, can we rent this movie? Jason goes to hell. It looks cool. Mom, can we rent this movie? Dead alive. This guy looks like he's having his ribcage pulled out of him. And my mom, again, wisely at the time saying, absolutely not. But still, this is where I got exposure to stuff. This is one of the many reasons I got into horrors because I'm like well look at this this looks gnarly and uh when I was 10 there was a video store walking on my way home from school called advanced video and poking around there I saw again so many movies I should not have watched at 10 years old and didn't but kind of put a little you know bookmark in there going like one of these days I'm gonna come back to that and also just those pe the people who ran the store knew who I was after a while. They're just like, oh yeah, that's the, the fifth grader that comes in here and she just pokes around never buying anything. But they never asked me to leave. They just figured, oh well, at least she's here and not, you know, doing anything else. So I have a real soft spot for independent video stores. Um, They're really, I'm glad that I got to exist at the tail end of these things. And yeah, before streaming, before even being able to go to a Best Buy or a Circuit City or a Media Play or a Strawberries, this is where you could go to browse movies. And you couldn't only just rent tapes, you could rent tape players, um, kind of like what libraries are doing now. There are libraries that are not only still loaning out films, we're loaning out disc players to people. Um, and it, this is a fun fact about a lot of uh, video stores, especially the mom and pop ones. So as I mentioned briefly earlier, a lot of video stores would pick their selection based on the covers because they're like, well, what's going to grab people's attention? Also, they didn't have time to watch all of these movies. So there were a lot of genres like the, um, the action genre, the sci-fi genre and the horror genre who would go out of their way to make fairly boring or blasé movies look really cool. A very good example of this is this movie called Critters, which if you've never seen the VHS cover for that, oh no, it's not Critters, it's Ghoulies. Ghoulies features a green little creature popping out of the toilet. So when you see that, you're just like, oh cool, this is great. This happens in the movie, right? No, no, it doesn't. But I... As I speak of her experience, the first time I saw that was at a midnight marathon. Well, or a cop too. I fell asleep in the middle. It's like I kept waiting for when's this coming out of the toilet? When's this coming out of the toilets? It Wait, never happens. Yeah, but think of from a business perspective how many times that VHS was likely rented from any video store ever, just because they're like, oh, this looks cool. So, um, video stores actually influence the cover art for um video stores also i'd like to give a nice shout out to um the store video headquarters so there is a website called lunch meet and it's for tape aficionados tape heads as they're called and someone wanted to say i wanted to give a brief history and a tribute to new england's greatest video store video headquarters so video headquarters was located in Keene, new hampshire and it existed from 1983 to 2015. And interesting enough, when it closed in 2015, it was still a popular and profitable store. I mean, obviously they had moved to renting out DVDs, but people still went there. He mainly went just because the location was, you know, the location's too expensive. He couldn't really afford it anymore. And it had outlasted a rival, um, Keen City Video, its rival, and outlasted uh, blockbuster it so this is another thing when we talk about um the mom and pop video stores versus a corporate chain um and i know this is something people talk a lot about a lot when they go oh small versus small businesses versus a big box store but these smaller stores these video rental stores again there was a community there versus you don't really have a community as much as a blockbuster so 
highly recommend if you're a big tape aficionado reading lunch meat and um looking up the history of keen city video but just reading that like it was profitable until it shut down it didn't go out of business the guy just decided eh, i'm kind of done i mean he was like i'm too old and it's getting this place is getting expensive to rent so this leads into my other point. Um, and again, I'm not here to tell you you're you're dumb for liking Blockbuster. I do understand for a lot of people, particularly people who might be younger than me, Blockbuster was the only video rental thing in the game. Um, Blockbuster was created as a single store and it went on to gobble up a lot of independent stores and become in many, many areas the only name in town. So... I do understand why people have nostalgia for it. I just kind of want to bust that bubble a bit. So it was founded in 1985 by David Cook. And this guy was really good at sort of analyzing data. So he knew like, okay, what types of movies should I get? What's What um, sells well? What do people like? Um, and it made him a very successful store owner. And it eventually expanded into a national chain. But as the chain grew any lack of the kind of cozy single store thing went away. As I put in here, uniformity grows. So as I said, all the re weird little movies that I came across, like the John Waters movies at Advanced Video, you don't really find those at Blockbuster unless it's like Hairspray. Um, so you don't have the possibility of discovering something really out of the way out of Blockbuster the way you would a small local store. And... Um, Another thing, which I'm not a fan of, I mean, I'm a librarian, we're never a fan of this. They were pretty censor happy. Um, they said they would stop carrying NC-17 NC movies in the early 90s. And they kind of, um, you know, they cited like, well, kids could see it. But hey, Blockbuster, you supposedly have this, pro this policy if you're not checking stuff out to kids. So a lot of people saw this as more of a, the cor uh, the corporate masters were, not comfortable renting out NC-17 films. And they refused to carry Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ. And um, I double-checked this. As, um, as recently as the aughts, it was still a store policy. It is like, we are personally not carrying that film. Um, and again, I am kind of like, not a fan of that. I understand if you don't want to watch it. But, and this is when we talk about book ch uh, book challenges as well. It is okay if you don't want to watch something or you're made uncomfortable by it, but what it's not okay to do is remove that from the collection and take away every other person's opportunity to watch that and make their own decision as well. And now we are getting to the start of streaming with Netflix. And uh, once again, hey kids, I'm old enough to remember when Netflix was just someone that sent you DVDs in the mail. Uh, my friend and I, uh, my roommate and I in college actually went in halfsies on a Netflix account so we could get discs sent to us because this was pre-streaming. So Netflix was founded in two, 2007, right after DVDs came out. And again, this idea of renting movies, renting a disc without having to go to the store is a really cool idea. People are like, oh, I could just browse their catalog and just have it sent to me versus get in the car, go to Blockbuster pick out a movie, uh, find a movie I want. Oh no, they don't have copies. That's a bummer. Versus Netflix, you put yourself in the queue. Sometimes you had to wait a little longer for one title than another, but you would eventually get it. Uh, similar to a queue like what we have at a library for a lot of items. So they start an online subscription service and then they have a flat fee where it's like, I think it is when I, when we had it, it was like $8 a month and there's no late fees. You could keep something for two months if you wanted to, and you would not get penalized, which definitely put it um, over Blockbuster. Also, I'd like to remind everyone, the Dairy Public Library does not have late fees, so you can check out an item, and if you're overdue, it's fine. So, yeah, beat that, Netflix. We don't have a flat fee. You can just come in and get stuff. And then they started streaming. A little earlier than people think, when a lot of people think Netflix and streaming, they think of, like, the 20... 2012 2013 when house of cards and orange is the new black came out but they started streaming in 2007 and when they had house of cards and orange is the new black that's when netflix truly became a household name and they kind of became seen as a place that had more cutting edge entertainment because 
both uh like network television passed on stuff like house of cards and the origins of new black so in many ways they're like oh we're cooler than cable we're cooler than network tv and a lot of people signed up simply because they wanted to watch these shows and at the time other than hulu netflix was kind of the only streaming name in the game and also it's down here 2023 netflix no longer has disc by mail but Netflix being the only name in the streaming game didn't last long because now there's a streaming service for practically everything. <laughs> and some don't exist anymore. They came and they went pretty quickly. Um, and not all streaming is bad, as we'll go here, but there's a larger issue at hand that in people are starting to kind of see the cracks in the armor. So what are the pros of streaming? You can watch everything from your home. You don't have to go out and buy media. You don't have to go and watch a movie. And it is actually very good for accessibility. If you're someone who can't leave your home for whatever reason, um, you might be, have a physical disability, you might be immunocompromised. There, like COVID still exists. There's a lot of people who still going outside and going into a crowded movie theater could be a risk. So streaming is a way for them to keep up with pop culture, which is fine. It's cheaper than cable or a movie ticket, or it was for a time. The, there is an algorithm that after it gets an idea of what you want to watch, it keeps showing you that. You don't have to spend hours browsing the website. You play a, pay a flat rate. You have a wide range of movies you can watch. You don't have ads. They have original content you can't find anywhere else. Like you can't watch Orange is the New Black on HBO. And if you have a digital library, you don't need to store physical media anymore. You have more space in your home. And again, if you're living in a studio apartment, I get why you don't want to have a lot of discs around. And there are some smaller um, streaming services like the Criterion Channel and Shutter and Movie, which are really highly curated um, selections versus, you know, stuff like HBO Max, which is just a lot of war um, Warner stuff and um, Discovery stuff. But here are the cons. And a lot of the stuff has developed in the past couple of years. Like, remember how I said no ads? Well, that's not the case anymore. And if you want to keep having your streaming service without ads, you've got to pay a lot extra. So we're now actually having younger people who grew up on streaming being introduced to ads and commercials for the first time, which is very funny because for me, it's like, oh, it's just a commercial. You, you deal with those. Um, and now we're also seeing like 10 or so years ago, it was pretty much Netflix and Hulu. That was it. Now we have a ton of streaming services. There's Paramount Plus, there's Amazon Prime, there's Hulu, there's HBO Max. I'm not calling it Max. Um, there are smaller services again, movie, Criterion Channel, Shutter. there's Disney Plus, if you're going to pay for all of those streaming services, especially the ones with no commercials, you almost may as well be paying for cable every month. Um, so people have brought that up. They're like, it, I've heard people say streaming is almost as expensive as cable now. And the only real difference you're getting is no ads. So at what point are you just like, oh, to heck with it. I'm just going to go back to cable. I mean, Todd, I know we have only, we have our limit at what, three or four services and that's it see i think we're at three at this point yeah no we're pretty we dumped netflix like a year or two ago and frankly i never forgave them for canceling glow so no big loss um uh the algorithm yes you get to see what you want but that means stuff is selected for you you don't get to discover stuff one of the things i loved about going to the video store was looking and going i've never heard of this movie and all of a sudden i want to watch it and i know my mom's going to say no but one one of these days i'm going to have a job and my own money and i can watch the john carpenter village of the damned and be very disappointed versus algorithm might not push that to me not to mention not everything is on streaming uh and this has been documented in a couple of different articles that there are a lot of films older films in particular that are not streaming or there are like sites like webs uh like netflix because they try to um appeal to a younger demographic they don't have older movies because they go oh kids don't want to watch anything that wasn't made before 1980 
The, and the only 80s movies they have are the 80s movies that everyone knows. So there are whole chunks of film history that are just not on streaming anymore. I think the best bang for you, the bang for your buck you get for classic movies is either Criterion Channel or if we're talking about a larger streaming service, um, HBO Max, because that has the Warner Archive and maybe Paramount Plus. It's, it's I will I will give a shout out to one other, although they're not really okay. They can be a pay service, but they're also you can access them free if for free. Mm hmm. Tubi has some surprisingly yes. deep cuts. Well, I was I was going to mention that. I'm like, if you want to watch older films and not pay, there is Tubi. But if you're talking about the big services that everyone knows, Fair. Like Netflix especially, I think, is the worst offender in terms of just completely, I don't want to say erasing film history because they're not, but they're omitting it because they think, oh, our viewers don't want to watch that anyway. And that is the biggest issue when it comes to st some streaming services is they just think, oh, you don't want it at all. So we're not going to provide it. Therefore, they are making those choices for you. And another thing I wanted to note, digital purchases. If you purchase a digital copy of a movie, those are not permanent. So if let's say you bought a movie from the um, from Apple movies, and this happened a few years ago, Apple's like, okay, so we're not, uh, we don't have the rights to these anymore. So you just don't have these movies. So even though you paid money for them, they can be deleted from your library and you will no longer have access versus if you buy a tape, you buy a disc, you bought it one time and you own it for however long that disc lasts. So what does physical media look like in 2024? I don't want to say it's bleak, man, but it's looking bleak, man. Uh, huh, Todd, um, any counter to that or are you kind of in the same boat as me? Well, I mean, I'm going to wait to get the, the answer we've discussed, but otherwise, yeah, it's as a main format, it's it has been enjoying a small resurgence, but I'm not going to yeah. immediately go... The drought is over. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, physical media revenue has dropped. Streaming has definitely eaten into those profits. Uh, physical media used to routinely give $2 billion to $1 billion a year. Um, and now it has dropped to uh, 700, uh, $754 million, which is still not a bad chunk of change for the first half of 2023. But it's still looking like it is on a downward turn and there's now projection um this is according to the digital entertainment group um and variety has covered this pretty extensively that 2024 could be the first year where the revenue drops below 1 billion for an entire year um granted the back half of 2023 saw a big boost with the release of oppenheimer selling out everywhere that had it 2023 Best Buy announces it's going to see selling physical media. I actually went to go pick up the Steelbook 4K of The Mist. And when I went there, I just told the guy at the uh, cash register, I'm like, look, I know this is not your decision, but I would just, if you want to pass this along to anyone that'll listen, not a fan of that choice. And he said, oh, no, trust me. I'm not a fan of it either. He's And he said, I'm kind of scared because the places where we can get stuff is getting smaller and smaller. And in February of this year, Disney said it's going to outsource the manufacturing of physical media to Sony. And some of that makes sense. Sony created Blu-ray. Um, Disney is putting some of their Disney Plus stuff on Blu-ray and 4K. So that does make sense. But that's also not a good sign for what Disney foresees as a feature for physical media. And keep in mind, Disney owns the, like, the libraries of multiple different companies it bought fox so, so oh, go on so this is something we didn't discuss before as far as issues with streaming this is one that has come a few times now is there have been a few films disney owns where people have been pointing out they are editing on them on their streaming service and oh, they are not point. telling people thank until you they... yeah no that is so um the biggest issue with that that came up was um in uh the french connection People have started, like, because number one, people were afraid when Disney bought Fox that some Fox titles would just never be on Disney Plus because Disney is, you know, constantly markets itself as a family-friendly company. There's but, a reason we bought that Omen box set. Yep. But when the French Connection came out, people noticed, like, hey, 
they're censoring certain words that Popeye Doyle is saying. And granted, they're not great words. In some cases, they're slurs. But it kind of comes down to it's the principle of the thing. Like, you can't, you cannot just censor this stuff. I mean, all, you know, Warner Brothers has it right. When they have their stuff on streaming, they just say you are going to probably see caricatures and hear language that was okay at the time. And it's not okay, or it was never okay, but a, you know, in today's world, it's going to seem pretty backwards. Um, But Disney is now getting to the point of, um, oh, we're just going to, have that not in there not to mention some of the move the shows they acquired like the simpsons when they first started streaming it the um aspect ratio was completely out of whack so <laughs> but back to the physical media as a whole um there's other stores like if you've been inside of a target or a barnes and noble their physical media section is getting smaller and smaller i went into barnes and noble to look at their criterions and i started crying because of how small it was uh, but still there are some bright spots um for Barbie, The Holdovers, and Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer sold out multiple times on Amazon. Uh, Christopher Nolan, even, he said he was joking, but I wonder how much he was really joking, but he's like, go buy a copy so no one can take it from you. <laughs> but he's right. Um, and there, there is, however, kind of a backlash. To, like, I guess the one bright spot is there's a backlash to this. There are a lot of people now who are like, oh, no, no, no. I am hoarding my physical medium. We'll get there for a moment. But um, I would also like to say, if you have a library card, come to the Dairy Public Library. We still have a lot of discs. I actually go out of my way to try to get classic films now because I know they're not available streaming. And they're probably one of the few places you can go that still has the video store feel. Uh, and also, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, VHS collection is now a hobby for a lot of people, and there is just a larger push now for the uh, just home media ownership. So, yeah, video stores, they still exist. This is Be Kind Video, and this is published in a great piece by the Washington Post. Um, it is called um, the one with VHS and video st um, stores, tape heads are fueling an analog revival. And granted, a lot of the stores they talk about, they have VCRs, they have VHS, but they also rent discs as well because they understand not everyone has a VHS player. But um, the reason a lot of people like that is this idea of, um, you know, I want to go into a store, I want to look at things, I want to have a community. I don't have a community if I'm sitting watching Netflix by myself. And The Guardian, uh, just last month, wrote a great piece, which I'd highly recommend everyone go read, which is about people who just love physical media and collect it. And so this is from um, the start of this article, quote, streaming was supposed to kill physical media and it has come very close. The DVD and Blu-ray market fell from 4.7 billion in revenue in 2017 to barely one and a half billion in 20, uh, 2022. In September, Netflix ended its movie by mail service. Best Buy has removed physical media from its brick and mortar stores and Target and Walmart may follow. Some new films are not even released physically at all, Oh, get to that in a moment. Next slide. Yet a counter-revolution has been gathering. Some film fans never gave up physical media. They've spent years quietly buying thrift store discs discarded by many U.S. households that no longer have DVD or Blu-ray players and waiting for their chance to rise again. Other fans, frustrated by streaming's limitations, have recently discovered rediscovered physical media and trickled to join its rearguard army. Physical media will never regain its heights, but it may live to fight a little longer, supported by loyalists and by cottage industry of independent and boutique film distributors that license classic films and sell high quality physical editions to eager, sometimes frantic fans. So there's a plus and minus to that as well. So that story about Disney outsourcing to Sony, this means that less copies are likely going to be made, but it also might become more expensive to produce. So discs might cost more. And even though there are a lot of boutique um, uh, uh, disc producers, like I own a lot of stuff by Vinegar Syndrome, we own a ton of stuff by Criterion, a Criterion Blu-ray costs $40. That's not something everyone can afford. So there are definitely drawbacks to this. And as I've said before, if you live in a studio apartment in New York City, you can't have all the discs in the world. So I understand this is not something attainable to everybody, but... Uh, if you're a person who loves physical media, just know you are not alone. 
there are thousands, probably millions of us. And I think slash hope with the fact that streaming's cracks are showing more, there might be more of a push for this. So is this the future of physical media? This is a tweet made by Guillermo del Toro, who like a lot of um, directors, like, you know, Martin Scorsese, No Shock, Lover, Physical Media, Christopher Nolan, um, they're all saying you need to hang on to this stuff. Um, actually, fun story about Martin Scorsese. He just donated a whole bunch of like VHS uh, VHS tapes of stuff he taped off of public, public access to the University of Colorado in Boulder. He just said, wow. here you go. Here's a home. Um, and it was just stuff he liked. He's just like, well, this is interesting. But um, uh, again, this idea of if you own it, you are the custodian of those films for generations to come. And while some people think that might be over dramatic, I look at some DVDs I have and they don't even have Blu-ray releases. I own the entire disc set of Six Feet Under. I'm not getting rid of that. I don't care that HBO let it show on Netflix. What if one day Netflix refuses it? What if one day Zaslav decides, I'm going to take this off HBO Max 2 and write it off as a tax thing? Where's it going to go? The only way it's going to survive is on disc. Or a better example is the Kevin Smith film Dogma, which fairly well received when it came out, has a cult following. It has not even, it never went past DVD because of, uh, Todd, actually, do you want to explain the Dogma rights situation? You know it more than I do. So this has become one of those stories which has added to the internet's already long list of reasons to have issues with Bob and Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> I don't know the specifics of how it came to this, but it turned into, it's not just Miramax owned the rights to that movie. The Weinsteins themselves personally owned the rights to that movie. Smith has tried for years to get it from them. He's offered to buy it. They have, and they have always asked for an obscenely large price tag and presumably to try and discourage him. He has tried a few times now to basically try and pony up the cash for it, and it still remains out of reach. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a shame. And I mean, look, not every movie is high art, but I mean, look, there. I, I own a copy of the movie called Killer Workout. You can imagine the quality of that film. But I also don't like the idea of stuff falling into complete, like a black hole of oblivion because no one can remember it and no one can see it. A recent example of this is, okay, Best Picture winner for 2023, Oppenheimer. Everyone saw Oppenheimer. Best Picture winner for 2022 um, was uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Does anyone remember the Best Picture winner for 2021 and 2020? Because people remember 2019 was Parasite. Put in the chat... Does anyone remember what won for 2020 or especially 2021? So there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it didn't, neither, I one had a very small release and one had no physical release. And granted, both of these films were hampered by COVID, but Nomadland, which was the winner for 2020, had a very small release and it was just a limited Blu-ray release and that was it. And you can watch it on Hulu. But if you don't know it's on Hulu, how are you supposed to see it? And if you, do, like, it, if it didn't get a big wide disc release, not something you could go buy at Best Buy, buy at Target, or even buy on Amazon for that long, it's actually, I think, out of print right now, how are you going to know? So that is how quick a film falls into obscurity. Nomadland is at least still somewhat remembered because of Francis McDormand. The film that's really fallen out of any public um, consciousness right now is Coda, which granted, in my opinion, shouldn't have won Best Picture that year. Not when we had West Side Story and Drive My Car, but that's a conversation for another day. But that was released by Apple TV+. Plus. Um, and it went into theaters, had a small release in theaters. Um, it was kind of in that release, um, that what Netflix did where it's like, we'll release it not as bad as Netflix doing, we'll release it in New York and LA for two weeks to qualify, but it was still a pretty small run. There's a reason the Academy has actually changed its qualifications for what kind of a release you need to have in order to get nominated. But 
he ends up winning kind of by surprise and then no disc release whatsoever there's still no disc release for coda and what's funny is there is another film called coda with anthony hopkins and katie holmes and i have repeatedly seen that film go out here and i i have not asked because it's not my business but my hunch is because people said oh that's the best picture winner right so I feel really bad for anyone because I'm like, okay, not only are you not getting the movie you want, you're gonna, you have to watch Katie Holmes attempt to act and no one wants to do that. There's a reason she's not really in movies anymore. Uh, sorry, that's mean, but true. But I think that's a, you know, a really big indicator of how a movie can very quickly be forgotten. And granted, there are Oscar winners that have been forgotten anyway, even with discs. But I haven't seen a movie fall out of public consciousness that quickly as that. Like even Green Book is remembered as a, oof, that was a bad winner. Or another case from 2021, the film Don't Look Up, which I think had a potential to be a much, have a much bigger impact on the larger conversation because of what that movie is satirizing. And it was a big part of the conversation for about two weeks. And then it just disappears because Netflix stopped promoting it on its front page. No one's looking for it anymore. And the fact that a lot of movies, especially films on Netflix, fall out of the conversation as quickly as they decide, oh, it's not on the front page anymore, is terrifying. And there's no way for anyone else to rediscover it because there's no way for anyone to have a copy of it. I mean, you know, I have people come to the library asking for it and I'm like, well, there's no way, sorry. So that's where it's really distressing. And not to mention, um, once again, a lot of stuff put out on the Searchlight label, which is a Fox company, but it's now owned by Disney. Disney is putting a lot of movies just into digital only now. Um, Chevalier, All of a Stranger's Theater Camp. Uh, these are all movies that came out and were modest successes. No, or had some awards acclaim. No disc release whatsoever. And uh, it's, pretty sad but luckily there are some saviors and this kind of leads into todd what do you think the physical media future is going to really look like simply put look at the companies that are, are thriving and how they're going it's a collector's market now these right. are they go from they kind of have their niche they go into and they will they won't you know, and a lot of them they will some will do like straight up just the film others will go like we will double up on extras we will try to get <laughs> cast and crew to offer new material we know we know our market we're going to make sure they get their uh, the best for their buck but again it's one where it's like it's not accessible you know it's not accessible for everybody todd you got me that 4k uh from showgirls from vinegar syndrome how much did that cost you given that was like the special edition i would say that was like 60 i think yeah but still who you know oh yeah you and i are maniacs uh not, most people are I mean, not going to do this i mean even half the time when you get things from like criterion or chef factory it's we're waiting for sales on that stuff it is and that's a big thing so um this is from uh the, well this is just like this is an anonymous source because they talk to a studio so this is from the guardian article where it says uh so Arrow, criterion kino lober and bfi are probably the best known distributors but in recent years a number of of others have thrived, including Shout Factory, Vinegar Syndrome, and Severn in the U.S., Eureka, Indicator, Radiance, and Second Sight in the U.K., Umbrella, and Imprint in Australia. Some labels inspire cults of their own. Criterion. I hey, I'm part of it. I'm not going to knock it. Um, with disciples arguing over which has the best remasters, special features, or packaging. To help cover costs up front, many boutique fo uh, boutiques focus on limited editions. Calls for pre-orders can inspire feeding frenzies. Boutiques tend to begin as shoestring operations serving small but highly motivated audiences, Nelson told me. A studio says, we sold um, 10,000 copies of this, and they'll go, that's terrible. But Vinegar Syndrome says, we sold 10,000 copies. This is amazing. So it's a smaller market, but that also means a more limited number of what's available. So we're not getting, like, millions of discs anymore. And uh, I mean, again, I think physical media, I don't believe, I'm with you, Todd, I don't think it's going to go the way of, um, well, if it goes the way of VHS, it becomes collector's market. I don't think it's going to go away completely, but I 
do think it is going to become the more mainstream releases will become a lot more bare bones and there i think we're just going to see the collector's market thrive but i mean you know criterions are costly i like to get criterions for the library but i also understand that costs me usually like i can buy two dvds for the price of one criterion so this then becomes, especially as someone who buys for a library, a little bit of a, you know, what do I prioritize? So that's kind of where we are. I don't like to end on a downer note, but it is one where I would just um, say, if you have stuff that you truly love on physical media, keep it. Keep it, keep just it in good condition. Nice shots in Vermont, huh? What? Well, I have to tell I have to tell you uh, that um, years ago when VHS was big, and we yeah. still have VHS players in our house and CD players Woo! and stuff, and um, we had trouble getting the VHS out of the machine, and when it did, it ripped it. Oh, I so I went back to where we rented it, and it cost me fifty dollars for replacement fee. <laughs> fifty oh. bucks. Yeah, yeah, it is unbelievable. Yeah, it's, well, and I think, like, so this was now? Like, recently? Well, no. Oh, no, this was a long time ago. No. When VHS, it was before CDs, when it was yeah. just VHSs. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and it also, I mean, it's also one to remember, like, back in the day, VHSs weren't exactly cheap either. I mean, well, again, this is another, like, I would say a good uh, argument for a library. If you end up breaking something, we'll just be like, um, you know, whatever it's going to cost us to replace this. And uh, most discs are not that amount of money. <laughs> Again, the but it, it is, I, I just tell people, like, if you have something, keep an eye on it. Keep it in, um, you know, if you have DVDs or any kind of a disc, don't keep them in direct sunlight. Because um, no. also, uh, you know, don't keep them where it's really humid. It uh, it's again i'm really not trying to end on a downer note but it's not looking great even no, so we keep them in the bedroom so there yeah. we have a whole supply and i have those cases that you can put them all in and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. but it's a it's it's definitely one where i do agree with Guillermo del toro that idea of keep this stuff with you so uh, if anyone has any questions or fun stories. Again, it was a like, great program tonight. It brought up back a lot of memories because I'm a, such a TV type person, mm -hmm. movie person that, uh, and we you know, the VHSs requests. and the CDs yeah, and everything. Yeah, requests for certain old television programs. And um, I've actually noticed that Shap Factory is one of the ones that um, continues to put older TV series out. So that's where I tell people, like, you know, if you wish, I'm not trying to advertise for these guys because I know they're expensive, but mm -hmm. it is one where if you really want something you like, you may want to keep a keep a copy of it. Also, Shout Factory does do a cool thing where they have Shout TV and they will show, show stuff um, for free with ads. So mm. that's another place to go. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's looking sad. So. <laughs> I'm th I'm calling a ways back here. There was one other note we missed as far as like the jump from VHS to DVD. It's a minor mm -hmm. one, but I think it's one which in certain markets definitely helped sell. What? Foreign language titles. DVD gave you the option to go like, you can get its original language with an English dub if you need it. Whereas oh, with yeah. tapes, it was, oh, good you buy point. one or the other. Wow. Oh, I didn't even know that. Oh my gosh. Good on you for bringing that up. But yeah, it's uh, hang on, hang on to your stuff is my, my essential point. And um, Netflix can go kick rocks. <laughs> look I, they, they they've been on my bad side for a while but the way they hoard their content it really i'm not a fan and like i, I have people asking for killers of the flower moon and i'm like I, I that's one where i think we will very likely get a disc release i can't see scorsese being okay with it not having a physical oh, release, yeah but yeah that would definitely was a, a good movie it was very different it's, it's yeah. one where it's like yeah i think we'll probably find out um, I've heard through the grapevine Criterion's getting it, but it's when does Criterion announce it? Because I know they got the Irishman a year after it was released. So that's what I've had to tell people. Like, it's likely going to happen. I can't see it not, but I have no idea. 
all I can do is peruse like the subreddits and forums and go like, does anyone have information on this? But yeah, hopefully you will join me for a more kind of sort of upbeat program next month on Gene Siskel. <laughs> I mean, that, that ends sadly, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. <laughs> but yeah. Um, was it, it was, was it Cisco, Cisco and Hebert or something? Yeah, was his partner? And yeah. Cisco, but, uh, yeah. And I'll kind of talk about why Cisco, kind, again, sort of talking about a longer legacy. Gene Siskel's legacy is so tied to Ebert versus Ebert was able to, by virtue of just living a little longer and being very good at marketing himself on the internet and being a big internet presence was able to build a legacy far beyond the show um mm -hmm. but that'll be something i will discuss um next month but a lot of a lot of good. I, i'm currently perusing for clips of them fighting over movies they disagreed on because <laughs> those are always funny but well, thank we, you so much no it was problem a great evening. i know and uh couple of movie stuff we have coming forward we finally planned out the rest of summer so um june i'm going to talk about one of my favorite directors pedro amadovar i also felt like it's appropriate for pride month because he's probably the most world famous queer director um i mean i think the u.s is probably john waters but if we're talking on a global scale probably pedro i mean he did all about my mother um broken embraces parallel mothers um a few years ago came out um uh july i'm going to be talking about roland emmerich mm -hmm. independence day okay this is mainly just me talking about independence day and um in uh august todd and i are going to be reviving a panel program we had from anime boston which is so you want to get into japanese cinema so keep your eyes peeled for that and i will i'm going to bid y'all good night thanks bye-bye now good night